So once we pass the stomach, we've entered now the small intestines. This is the major site or main site of absorption for the entire gastrointestinal tract or digestive tract. In fact, 90% of absorption occurs in the small intestines. And what we find are cells called brush border cells, also referred to as absorptive cells. And what they are at the end of the day is your simple columnar epithelial cells. So let's go ahead and draw a brush border cell, aka absorptive cells. So once again, these are your simple columnar epithelial cells. This is the superficial layer of the mucosa that makes up that epithelial tissue layer. And what they have are microvilli, all right? So these finger-like projections, microvilli. So when you look at the surface, of the microvilli, they look like bristles in a brush, hence the name brush border cells, all right? Now, what we find embedded in the plasma membrane of these brush border cells are enzymes, which I'm going to color in in these red circles, all right? So these are transmembrane proteins. These are enzymes that we're gonna to refer to as brush border enzymes. So to save time, I'll just write B, B, that means brush border enzymes. And what they will do is they will do the final cut of these macromolecules that ultimately will be absorbed, all right? Now, we'll talk about the macromolecules, and uh, in fact, I've got some slides that covers macromolecules, and this should be a review of what you discussed back in 189. So bottom line, the macromolecules we cannot absorb them until they're literally down to their individual building blocks. It is because the molecules otherwise would be too big. Our brush border cells cannot take them in. It's too big. So they're referred to as small intestines because the diameter of their lumen is smaller than the large intestines, which we will discuss after the small intestines. But they are longer than the large intestines. So we're looking at approximately 18 to 20 feet long. That's just average. So they're quite long. And they're divided into three divisions. You have your duodenum, which is over here. You have your jejunum, which is the next segment or division of the small intestines. And then finally, we have the ileum, which is the last segment of the uh, small intestines. Duodenum, or the duodenum, as some people pronounce it, is approximately 10 inches long. And so what we're looking at over here, all of this, this C shape, that's your duodenum, right? Which is your first segment of the uh, small intestines. So what this will receive will be from the chyme that's coming in from the stomach, right? So chyme from stomach. It's also gonna receive pancreatic juice from the pancreas. So this thing over here, this is all pancreas, which is what we're gonna discuss as well, one of the accessory digestive organs, and it will produce pancreatic juice. So that pancreatic juice will empty into the duodenum or duodenum. Another fluid that empties into the duodenum is the bile. And that bile is brought to the duodenum via what's called the common bile duct. So this common bile duct is what's going to deliver the bile and empty also into the duodenum. And speaking of bile, the liver produces the bile while the gallbladder stores the bile. So there's a whole discussion of the liver and the gallbladder that we'll look at later on. The next segment, the middle segment of the small intestines is the jejunum. That's approximately eight feet in length. So this is where a bulk of not only chemical digestion occurs, but nutrient absorption as well. So this is where those building blocks of those macromolecules are absorbed, all right? So we will look at that as well. And then finally, we have the ileum uh, that's approximately 12 feet in length. Uh, there is some absorption that occurs in the ileum, but nowhere near the percentage of absorption that occurs in the jejunum. Okay, so let's now go ahead and illustrate the, uh, a section of the intestinal walls, and what you're going to see are folds within folds within folds. So there's a lot of surface area happening in the small intestines because, after all, 
not only do we have chemical digestion occurring in the small intestines, but as well as 90% of that absorption happens in the small intestines. So clearly it's all about surface area. So we'll begin with the grossest fold that we see. And in fact, here's a nice picture of it right over here. So we're gonna draw this out, all right? So make your picture nice and big. And what I'm drawing are those circular folds, all right? So we'll label this circular folds. And this you can see grossly. So when you look at the surface of the small intestines, you can visually see these circular folds. It turns out that we've got additional folds. And let's go ahead and draw that. We'll, we'll draw these additional folds. All right. And what I'd like to do is take one of these and we're going to expand it over here. All right. So we're taking one of these right here and we're going to expand it. So here we have that. And we're going to refer to this as a villus. If we look at the surface of the villus, what we find are these brush border cells. Now, I'm going to do my best to draw that out. So I'm only going to draw one, but they line the surface of that villus, right? So we'll take this, expand that. And there you go. There's your brush border cells, BB cells. And we talked about this already, also called the absorptive cells. And then, of course, we can't forget additional foldings, finger-like foldings, microvilli. So circular folds, villus, brush border cell, microvilli. A lot of folding going on. So if we refer to this picture above, here are those grossly circular folds that we can visually see. And then if we take one of those, which is what this diagram is doing, here is your villus. And then if we expand on that once again, it's not showing it, but we'll have the brush border cell. And here's the microvilli. Actually, I just noticed that this is a mistake. This should be, so erase that, and that should be your brush border cell. Because that brush border cell is what contains the microvilli, the finger-like projections, not the villus. So this slide shows us several images of, again, the lining of our small intestines. And uh, one thing I, I do want to discuss a little bit more is your villi, all right? So we have multiple villi, singular villi. So if we're looking at one of these, that's a villa. So what we're looking again is this structure over here. Now, what we find are these lymphatic capillaries that we've discussed already, the lacteals. This is especially important when we talk about the absorption of lipids, all right? And of course, that is integrated or woven around the blood capillaries. So we have our blood capillaries, and then interwoven are these lymphatic capillaries that we're calling lacteals. Lymphatic capillaries found in the small intestines, once again called lacteals. Now, if we look at the bottom pictures over here, this one over here, as well as this one, this is just showing us the layer of the wall of the small intestines. In this particular case, it's a duodenum. So you have your mucosa, your submucosa, your muscularis, and your serosa. Now, how do I know the boundary between mucosa and submucosa? Once again, it's that muscularis mucosa that basically determines whether you're in mucosa and now you're in submucosa. Now, what we find in the mucosa, in addition to the circular folds and, and um, the villi and the, the brush border cells, are intestinal glands, all right? So we find these intestinal glands found in the mucosa, and then deep to that, in the submucosa, we have our duodenal glands. So I'm not going to discuss what they produce. It's just enough to know that we have intestinal glands in the mucosa and duodenal glands in the submucosa. Now, the fact that we have the muscularis externa, right, we can't forget the two layers of the muscular externa, I hope it makes sense that we're going to have a lot of movement happening in the small intestines. What type of movements are we talking about? Well, we're talking about peristalsis and as well as segmentation, right? So segmentation, that back and forth movement that we talked about before, where that allows the intestinal juices to not only be chemically digested, but it allows for absorption to occur. And then eventually that intestinal juice moves into the next segment of the digestive tract, and that is the large intestines. So let's now discuss the pancreas. 
In addition to the salivary glands, the pancreas is an example of an accessory digestive organ. It is elongated, it's spongy, that's found tucked behind the stomach, and the pancreas is approximately about six inches in length. Now, the pancreas has two very important functions. Function number one, it functions as an endocrine gland. What does that mean? What that means, it produces hormones, all right? So anytime you have an endocrine gland, that means it secretes hormones, it produces hormones that ultimately will end up in blood. Now, what hormones are we looking at? Well, hormone number one, glucagon. Glucagon is produced by cells called the alpha cells of pancreatic islets. And glucagon is produced in response when our blood glucose, or I should say our blood sugar levels, falls. All right, so when our blood sugar declines, then glucagon is secreted into blood. The next hormone produced by the endocrine gland of the pancreas is the insulin hormone. So insulin, produced by the beta cells of pancreatic islets, is a hormone release in response when our blood sugar or blood glucose rises. So we'll talk about glucagon and insulin more when we get to the endocrine system. What we're focusing on right now, as far as the pancreas is concerned, is the exocrine gland function of the pancreas. Now, if we say exocrine gland, that means it's going to discharge the product into some type of lumen. In this particular case, it's the lumen of the duodenum, all right? So please note, these secretions will not end up in blood, nor do we want it to end up in blood, and you'll see why. All right, so the uh, pancreatic juice, all right, so if you see pancreatic juice, you want to think, all right, these are basically going to contain the secretions produced by the exocrine gland function of the pancreas. So what exactly does this pancreatic juice consist of? Well, they consist of digestive enzymes, all right? So we're going to refer to these digestive enzymes as pancreatic enzymes, but keep in mind they are digestive enzymes. So what are some examples of these pancreatic enzymes? That's part of this pancreatic juice. Carbohydrates, which are enzymes of which the substrate are carbohydrates. Another enzyme are lipases. So this are enzymes that break down lipids, nucleases that break down DNA and RNA, and proteases that break down proteins. So examples of which are trypsin and chymotrypsin. Be careful here. We're not talking about pepsin. Pepsin is produced strictly in the stomach. It needs that extremely acidic pH, which we do not have in the duodenum. The duodenum certainly cannot handle that extremely acidic pH, all right? So, so in addition to these digestive enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, that's part of the pancreatic juice, we also have the bicarbonate ions. That's part of the pancreatic juice as well. And what this pancreatic juice will do is it'll neutralize those hydrogen ions, right? Because that chyme, that's coming from the stomach. Speaking of the chyme, the moment the chyme enters the duodenum, we're not going to refer to it as chyme anymore. We're going to refer to it as intestinal juices, all right? So we have a lot of juices going on here. We've got the chyme that's in the stomach, then we have the intestinal juices in the small intestines, and then we have the pancreatic juices that are produced by the pancreas. So let's focus in on this particular image right over here that I circled. So uh, here is the lumen. So let me... I like that. So out here is the lumen of the duodenum or the duodenum. And we have this donut-shaped structure. So this is shaped like a donut. And just like a donut, there's an opening right in the middle. And that donut-shaped structure is called the major duodenal papilla. And that opening is where the pancreatic juice will empty into the lumen of the duodenum. Not only will the pancreatic juice empty into that duodenum, we also have this common bile duct that will deliver the bile that will also empty into the duodenum. Now, the pancreatic duct, incidentally, so that is the conduit that will essentially carry the pancreatic juice, ultimately emptying, once again, into the duodenum or duodenum. So this is just essentially another image, once again, and uh, this is showing us the bile duct the uh, common bile duct that will eventually empty the bile into the uh, duodenum or duodenum, 
which is the segment over here. There's those uh, donut shaped major duodeno papilla. And then here is the pancreatic duct. And that's going to drain the pancreatic juice also into the lumen of the duodenum. This image is just showing us the emptying of one of those carbohydrates the pancreatic amylase that's part of that pancreatic uh, juice, um, one of the digestive enzymes. And what this will digest are the polysaccharide starch. And uh, then eventually, once it makes its way to the jejunum, what we have is what's called contact digestion, and that's because of those brush border cells. Uh, remember, the brush border cells have those brush border enzymes that I mentioned before. And so what those brush border enzymes will do is we'll do the final cut until we actually have the actual building block of the macromolecule. In this particular case, it's a monosaccharide, one of which is glucose. So when it says contact digestion, that means essentially those brush border enzymes found in the microvilli uh, that will do, the, again, the final cut. And at this point, we are now small enough, glucose is small enough to where it can now be absorbed. So let's now look at those endocrine glands and exocrine glands that's part of the pancreas. So let's begin with the exocrine gland part of the pancreas. That involves these acinar cells. So these acinar cells that are clustered together, as you see, are what produces the pancreatic juice. And that, of course, consists of those digestive enzymes, and that ultimately drains into that pancreatic duct, which empties into the lumen of the duodenum or duodenum. So that's the exocrine gland part of the pancreas. Now, what about the endocrine part of the pancreas? Well, that's your pancreatic islets, right? So we know that we have the alpha cells and we have the beta cells or the alpha cells of pancreatic islets that produces glucagon and the beta cells of pancreatic islets that produces insulin. Now look at where the glucagon and insulin will end up in. Well, that's going to end up in blood. All right, and uh, we have some more images down here, so you can check that out if that helps you. And over here on the top left, we have, again, those acinar cells. That's the exocrine part of the, uh, the uh, pancreas, and that's producing those digestive enzymes, the pancreatic enzymes, and then ultimately it ends up in the pancreatic duct and that conduit that empties that juice into the duodenum. And these, what you see over here, so these are actual pictures of slides taken of the pancreas. And here are those pancreatic islets, right? The alpha beta that produces insulin glucagon, and we have it over here as well. And then surrounding it are these acinar cells, right? That basically is what's producing, once again, those pancreatic enzymes.